Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Jody Smith. I am the branch head of our Oceans, Reefs, Coast and Antarctic branch here at Geoscience Australia. And um, I'm pleased to welcome you all along to today's Wednesday seminar. Uh, I'd like to start with an uh, acknowledgement of country. So Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, and it acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters, sky, and community. We pay our respects to people, the cultures and elders past and present. So thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, Dr. Marty McNeil, McNeil, who's going to be speaking to us about Antarctica. For those of you who've been outside this morning, it feels a little bit like Antarctica. Uh, it was minus 4.4 when I went out for a walk with my dog this morning, so it did bring back some memories of my, my days in Antarctica. Um, but I think it helped set the mood for, um, for what Marty will be speaking about today. So um, Marty has recently returned from a voyage to Antarctica, um, and so her talk will be on the sights and soundings from the Shackleton Ice Shelf, which is in East Antarctica. Uh, Dr. Marty McNeil is a marine geoscientist who maps and characterises Australia's seafloor environments to support evidence-based management of marine natural assets. Marty has a passion for discovery and enjoys turning seabed data into useful and accessible information. Her research focuses on geomorphic interpretation of seabed features to understand past and modern earth system processes. So please um, join me in welcoming Marty to the um, podium and really looking forward to the seminar today. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jodie, and a very warm welcome to everyone in the room and, and online. So as Jodie said, I'm a marine geoscientist and I've recently returned from a 10-week research voyage to East Antarctica with a German-led multinational and multidisciplinary team on board the icebreaker Polarstern to study changes in the East Antarctic ice sheet. And today I'd like to share some of that experience with you. This talk will cover a little bit about the science objectives and the rationale for where we went and why and bring you along to experience what it's like uh, to live and work on board a research vessel in one of the most remote, sensitive and spectacular places on the planet. This isn't so much a scientific talk where I'll present results and findings from our work, partly because uh, it's too soon. We've all just returned to our home institutions and they've got many months and even years of data and sample analysis ahead of us. And partly because uh, the voyage data are currently under a moratorium before it can be made open and publicly available to the science community. But before we get the voyage underway, I'd first like to just give a little bit of background and context to Geoscience Australia's role and capabilities in, in Antarctica. So let's start with wrapping our heads around the size and scale of Australia's Antarctic Territory. Our territory extends over 11,000 kilometres of coastline, it covers nearly 6 million square kilometres of land and over 2 million square kilometres of marine jurisdiction. So all of that area represents almost a third of Australia's land and marine jurisdictions. Geoscience Australia conducts mapping, monitoring and research activities to support the Australian Antarctic program. Our geoscience expertise supports a whole of government strategy and action plan to manage Australia's key national interests in Antarctica. Our capabilities inform environmental management, provide baseline information for scientific research, improve our understanding of earth systems and climate, and contribute to Australia's international treaty obligations. And we are a partner organisation to the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership, securing Antarctica's environmental future, and the Australian Centre of Excellence in Antarctic Science. Our Antarctic capabilities sit across a number of Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028 impact areas. We undertake marine and terrestrial geoscience, geophysical monitoring through a network of observatories, earth observations from space and geospatial science. Our expertise in marine geoscience to acquire, compile and interpret seabed data, including bathymetry, which tells us about the seabed topography and depth, backscatter, which tells us about the seabed hardness, sediments and sub-bottom and seismic profiling meant that we were well placed to support our German colleagues in their expedition, the third of their easy or East Antarctic ice sheet instability voyages to study past ice sheet change and Southern Ocean climate processes. 
So let's get underway. We departed from Hobart on the 6th of February for a journey of 70 days with 50 scientists travelling 12,000 nautical miles or 22,000 kilometres, which is literally halfway around the world. Our ship is the Polarstern or Pole Star, the German research icebreaker operated by the Alfred Wagner Institute for Polar and Marine Research. Although Polarstern has been in operation since 1982, this was her first visit to an Australian port, which was celebrated in Hobart with an official reception and um, a public exhibition and engagement activities in Hobart. So the voyage obje objectives were to study ice sheet changes in East Antarctica during past warming periods and changing climate. And we'll do that by acquiring new geological and geophysical data and samples. And we'll use those to construct new models to characterise the nature and timing of past changes. It was very much a multinational expedition with scientists from Germany, Austria, France, Argentina, Spain, Greece, and a contingent of six fabulous Australians. That's me in the middle there, and I think some of them might be online today, so hello to you. I can't see you if you are. So you might be wondering why all of these scientists have travelled halfway around the world with ships and helicopters and fancy equipment. What's driving the need for this science? Well, you've probably heard that global climate is changing, oceans are warming, ice is melting, and sea level is rising. And it's critical for society that scientists and climate modellers can make the best possible predictions of what is changing, where, when, and how fast, so that decision makers and communities can be informed and prepared. So one of the tools in our toolkit is to look at how and where similar changes have occurred in the past. Geology is like nature's time capsule that we can unlock and read like the pages of a history book, learning from the past to try and understand and predict what the future might look like. So here's where we went on our expedition halfway around the world. <coughs> the squiggly red line is our voyage track from Hobart down to our study area at the ice margin. We were basically three teams. Two land teams were transferred by helicopter with all of their equipment and their camping <coughs> gear and their food. One at the Gaussberg Volcanic Cone for geology and geodesy investigations. And one at Bunga Hills for geology and paleolimnology. So limnology is the study of lakes and paleolimnology uses lake sediment cores to get at those past climate archives. So I was part of the marine team which stayed on board the ship doing geology, seabed mapping, sub-bottom profiling, seismic surveys, oceanography and seal tagging, but more about all of that a little bit later. My role in the science party was in the hydroacoustics team. So we used the ship's echo sounders or sonars to map the seabed. The multi-beam echo sounder gives us an image of the seabed surface, which shows the topography and a representation of water depth. The sub-bottom profiling echo sounder penetrates uh, through the top tens of metres of the seabed to give um, a vertical image of the layers of sediment, a bit like taking a slice through a layer cake and looking at it side on. So I was working in the sub-bottom profiling data acquisition and processing the data so it can be used by the other teams to make decisions about their survey site selections and targeted uh, sediment coring. So here's an example of what the sub-bottom profiler data looks like at various resolutions. So these shapes and patterns give us clues about past ice sheet movement. And so looking at the shape of the features can tell us whether the seabed was completely covered by a glacier or ice sheet, or whether it was open ocean with um, icebergs floating around during warmer periods, a bit like today. So we were also looking for areas with deposits of undisturbed layered sediments suitable for coring. Uh, so taking long cores through these types of sediments, um, these layer cake sediments, allows us to unlock that time capsule and reconstruct the history of past glacial and interglacial cycles. And to date samples to try and put timings on when these changes occurred, how fast and for how long. A little bit like counting tree rings. We also use the multi-beam mapping to identify glacial features that are preserved on the seabed. Features like grounding zone wedges, iceberg plough marks, 
and mega scale lineations help us to build up a picture about past environments and the processes that shaped them. For example, the grounding zone wedge is a large deposit of sediment with a distinctive shape that indicates a build up of sediment from where the ice sheet movement has paused and then retreated. Our geophysicists also use deep reflection seismic profiles to image hundreds of metres to even kilometres below the seabed to identify the same types of features preserved in the geological past. And I'll, give, I'll come back and give, talk a little bit more about the seismic profiling a bit further on. So what I'd like to do now is take you on a bit of a journey through what a typical day and some not so typical days look like on board a research vessel in Antarctica. So this was pretty much my daily schedule, which I will go through in a bit more detail in the following slides. But basically my work in the hydroacoustics lab was split across two four-hour shifts, one from 12 to 4 p.m. and one from midnight to 4 a.m. And everything else, including sleep, which was also done in two shifts, was fitted in around that. So getting enough sleep was always my highest priority, as was checking the daily menu which was often quite amusing as uh, some food names and descriptions got lost in translation between, from German to English. So having worked the night before, I'd set my alarm for 10 a.m., wake up, look out the window to check the weather, which was always ever-changing. And so here's what my cabin looked like. So cabins are shared between two people with single bunk beds, a small um, sitting area and a table, a couple of drawers each, and a small ensuite bathroom. Most of the time the bathroom was operational, but sometimes not, which is not unusual. I haven't been on a marine research voyage yet that didn't have some kind of plumbing issues from time to time. So then I would head down to the gym and get some exercise on the treadmill before heading to the mess for my first meal of the day, which was actually lunch having slept through breakfast um, after my night shift uh, the night before. At 12, I would head, that could be 12 p.m. or 12 a.m., I would head downstairs to the hydroacoustics lab, which we lovingly nicknamed the Bat Cave, partly because, like bats, our lives revolved around our echo sounders, and partly because the lab was usually quite dark and closed in because we had heavy steel covers over the portholes during stormy weather. From time to time the covers would come off and we had a nice view out the porthole of passing icebergs, but it wouldn't be long before the next storm warning and the covers would go back on. And in the end, the covers went on and stayed on until we were all the way back to port in Namibia. <coughs> so the main photo here is my workstation for the sub-bottom profiling with a few different computers and monitors for data acquisition and processing. And sitting behind me out of view is a similar setup for the technicians operating the multi-beam echo sounder. So the multi-beam technicians were my shift buddies um, on the same kind of schedule that I was on. Some significant milestones were reached while my shift buddy and I were on duty, including crossing 60 degrees south, which marks the latitude at which we are officially in Antarctica under the Antarctic Treaty rules. And crossing the Antarctic polar circle at about 66 degrees south, which marks the limit at which the sun remains above the horizon for 24 hours of daylight in summer and below the horizon for 24 hours of darkness in winter. So uh, some of you with a seafaring background might know that there's usually an official ceremony to mark the occasion of crossing the polar circle. So the Bat Cave was quite a popular place at times with the voyage chief scientist and the geology and seismic teams coming down to look at the previous night's mapping and data collection and to have a look and see if we'd found any layer cake sediments. Um, so we'd make our planning decisions about where to target sediment coring and conduct seismic surveys. And this was always a really collaborative discussion with everyone having input. And I learned a lot from some of the more experienced team members. At the end of my shift, I would always try and get some time outside, depending on the weather or in spite of the weather. Um, it was Billy Connolly that said there's no such thing as bad weather, just the wrong clothing. So to get geared up with the right clothing to go outside can take a good five or ten minutes to get all of the layers on. So it's best not to forget to go to the bathroom before heading out. 
Getting outside gives us a welcome opportunity to get out of the bat cave and to soak up some sunshine, breathe some fresh air, even if it's below freezing, and experience some of the incredible sights and sounds of the ship and our surroundings. During storms where the wind force and sea state were too dangerous to be outside, the decks would be closed and we'd be confined indoors for a couple of days until the weather clears. I hope that's not making all of you seasick. <laughs> The other reason to get outside, of course, is for wildlife spotting. Um, there were times when we were surrounded by plenty of whales, mostly minke and humpback whales, and the emperor penguins were calling. Um, you, we could hear them like you'd see and hear in an Attenborough documentary. And they were swimming around at times really right alongside the ship, very close. There was lots of bird life, especially petrels and a few albatross, and the Adelie penguins kept us amused with their comical antics. And the occasional la lazy seal was seen basking on an ice floe, and they might look up and give us a nod if they could be bothered. In the evening, dinner was served at 5.30 p.m. I think I already mentioned that the menu translations often kept us amu amused at two o'clock in the morning in the bat cave. I was never quite game to try the mustard chili cream soup, and I'm not sure whether Steve was a stowaway from a previous voyage, just in case our supplies ran out which they nearly did. So after dinner, people would just hang out together in any of the three lounge areas, doing puzzles and playing cards or board games like Werewolf, watch a movie or just chat and get to know each other. At 7.30 p.m. each evening, we would all meet in the cinema room for the nightly science meeting and weather forecast. The chief scientist would give us an overview of the previous day's activities and our achievements and provide the forward plan for the following 24 hours or so. We'd get an update on how our land colleagues were faring, and a few times a week volunteers would give informal talks, uh, science related or not, about any topic of interest, which was a great way to get to know each other. A nightly highlight was always the weather forecast, because everybody loves talking about the weather. We had a very enthusiastic meteorologist and a technician from the German Weather Bureau, and they were doing real-time forecasting at the ship's location as well as for each of the two land field sites. So each night we would get uh, presented with us this summary table of the weather, which would tell us about the wind direction and wind speed. So the wind speed is on the Beaufort scale. The Beaufort scale only goes up to 12. Um, is it gonna be snowy, visibility, the air temperature, and then the adjusted wind chill uh, temperature? Uh, what the sea state was likely to be and suitability or not for helicopter operations. So like many things in life, being in the red is bad. A meteorologist was very excited about bad weather. And at the end of the voyage, she gave us a best of summary of all the low pressure systems we encountered, including the most beautiful low and the deepest low. So if you're not familiar, a low pressure system is a bit like a cyclone that brings very strong winds, clouds and rain, or in our case, snow. In the Southern Ocean, they move from west to east, and at the same time, they're kind of rotating clockwise. So depending on where the ship is, we might get westerly winds, or if we're sitting kind of just above the low, or strong easterlies when we're at the coast. Um, and at sea, strong winds and low pressure bring waves and swell. In all, there were 24 low pressure systems in our region from the time we left Hobart until we docked in Namibia. So if you do the maths, that works out to be a low pressure system forming about every three days. Our minimum air temperature was minus 15 degrees, but that doesn't account for wind chill. I think our coldest wind chill temperature was minus 29. And yes, I did get dressed and go outside that day for 15 minutes, just so that I could say that I did. Uh, for me, the weather forecasting really was an incredibly interesting aspect of the voyage. Um, the low pressure systems are moving and the ship is moving and it was like this dance to pinpoint what the weather conditions would be like at the ship's location today and tomorrow and the prediction of where we would be relative to the weather for the following days. Our maximum wave height that we encountered at the ship was only six metres uh, because um, at times there were much higher waves and swell around us, but the ship's captain and the meteorologist would plan our route together and divert us around the low pressure systems as much as we could, which we were all very grateful for. 
The meteorologist was incredibly accurate given all of the moving pieces and I just found it fascinating. 8.30 p.m. back to bed, sleep until the next shift in the back cave. So some not so typical days. So with 50 scientists on board, there were quite a few birthdays along the way, including my own and my wonderful cabin mate's 30th birthday. And here she is being presented with a broken spare part from one of the seismic air guns. The crew and cooks organised barbecues on the back deck to celebrate milestones like the midpoint of the voyage and the last day of science before leaving the ice and to mark the occasion of crossing the Antarctic polar circle. So there were a couple of really memorable days for me. Um, the first one was when I got the opportunity to take a 40 minute helicopter flight over the Vanderford Glacier on a spectacularly clear and sunny bluebird day. The chief scientist came down to the bat cave and he told my shift buddy and I that there were two seats on the next flight. If you want to be on it, get dressed and be ready on the heli deck in 45 minutes. So we did not need to be asked twice. So why are we so interested in Vanderford Glacier? The Vanderford Glacier system is a bit like a canary in the coal mine. It sits within a region of East Antarctica that is the most vulnerable to thinning, melting and contributing to sea level rise. I want to show you this rather complicated figure from a recent science publication. It looks a bit scary because it is a little bit scary, but we'll break it down. If my mouse will point, there we go. In the centre is the map of Antarctica covered in ice and it's coloured by the amount of change in ice mass. So red means losing mass or melting and um, yeah, red means losing mass or melting. And so the red around Antarctica is the Southern Ocean coloured by temperature. So red is increasing temperature or ocean warming. Again, red is bad. This little rectangle inset box is this area here in East Antarctica that is the most vulnerable to melting, not just from the surface, but because of the incursion of that warm water flowing underneath the ice shelf. So this area includes Vanderford Glacier and the Shackleton Ice Shelf. The Totten Glacier contains enough fresh water locked up as ice, equivalent to almost four metres of global sea level rise. So here's a much more simplified version. And you can see how warming water can get in underneath the, the ice shelf. And this type of topography is one of the reasons why we're doing all of this high resolution seabed mapping. But there's quite a bit of uncertainty in the ice sheet and sea level models and we're trying to get better information to reduce the uncertainty. So flying over the Vanderford Glacier was quite an emotional experience, um, not just because of the size and the scale and the beauty of it, but I was also imagining a world without it. After the helicopter flight that night on the midnight to 4am shift, the officer on the bridge called down to the bat cave and told my shift buddy and I, you better get dressed and go outside. And this was the reason why. So this was our first aurora for both of us and having had the helicopter flight together earlier in the day, it was really quite an overwhelming day and one that I'll never forget. So we were lucky enough to get three auroras like this in between all of the low pressure systems in the wee hours while most of the ship was sleeping. And I hope with all the aurora activity that's been around lately, some of you might have seen it too. My other memorable experience was having the opportunity to go on shore again in the helicopter and help the geodesy team to install a GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite System or super fancy GPS station near the Bunger Hills. So the top photo is Jack installing the antenna and the bottom photo is me constructing the frame to hold the data logger, the batteries and the solar panel. So it was a gorgeous sunny day, but what the photos don't show is that it was about minus 20 degrees with wind chill and the wind was gusting so strongly that I got knocked over twice and had the bruises on my knees to show for it. But we got the station constructed with minutes to spare before the helicopter came back to pick us up. It was a very bumpy flight back to the ship. So while all of that was going on for me, what were the other teams up to? So the multi-beam technicians acquired and processed a total of 134,000 square kilometres of seabed mapped, including the transits. The geology team collected about 30 sediment cores, which they will use to unlock that time capsule and track 
past ice sheet movements, those warm water incursions, and sea ice change over time. So the coring team used, uh, was using a long gravity coring system, which is just deployed over the side of the ship using this special cradle. The system can take cores from five, to five metres to about 18 metres long, and it's the same system that we have on Australia's Investigator and Noyino research vessels. When you're in deep water, that whole process can take a couple of hours, and the weather might not be the same on retrieval as it was on deployment. They also used a multi-coring system to take very short sediment cores of the seabed surface to about 60 centimetres. And here's the geology team in the lab uh, splitting, photographing and logging their cores and taking subsamples. So what's so interesting about all that mud? So this is one, one 18 metre long core cut into sections. And one of the most obvious things that you can see straight away here is the difference in colour between light and dark. So the light sections of mud are full of nanofossils, glass skeletons of tiny little sea creatures that photosynthesize like plants when they're alive. So photosynthesis requires sunlight. So during the light sections, it must have been open ocean or a warm period without sea ice. In the dark sections, there's none of these little nanofossils. So sunlight to the ocean must have been blocked, presumably by ice cover during a cold period. So this is how we start to read those climate archives. And the paleoceanographers will go away and do lots of chemical analysis on the samples to try and work out what the temperatures were at the time and whether these can be dated so we can put timings on these changes. So as I mentioned earlier, we had a team of geophysicists doing reflection seismic surveys to image deep into the sediments and the geological layers beneath the seabed, much deeper than the Parasound subbottom profile. Sub -bottom profiler. So that scale bar there I think is 260 metres and that one there I think is about 500 metres. So this system works by towing a set of air guns that create a percussion sound wave that travels down and penetrates through the seabed, reflecting off the different layers and then returning back up to the surface. The return signal is re received by a long streamer of hydrophones that's towed out the back of the ship. And so here's the air guns just going off there and maybe you can just make out the hydrophone uh, streamer there. And here's the team at the end of their last seismic survey. The air guns have already been brought in and now they're bringing in the streamer and you can see that they're tethered onto the ship for safety. So during the seismic surveys, we had professional marine mammal observers on duty who were looking out for whales in the survey area. So if whales were sighted, the air guns had to be shut down until the whales have passed through, which creates a few gaps in the data, but all in all, it was a very successful survey. So the seal tagging team were studying Antarctic krill and food webs through tracking the behaviour of their predators, which is the seals. So the tags on the seals record all sorts of data about the environment, including what depths the seals are diving down to. So seal dive data has led to some recent discoveries that the seabed was in fact much deeper than previous models had shown. So the seal taggers would be flown out by helicopter to look for suitable landing sites. And we had two professional seals, seal scientists on board and they trained up other volunteers from the science party to go out with them and help in the field. The training was very serious. The land teams were camping out in the field and they experienced some pretty rough weather. They did manage to make their geodetic measurements, do their geological mapping, I don't know how, collect a lot of rocks and take some lake sediment cores before we came, the ship came back and we picked them up before another major storm passed through. So our voyage comes to an end in the port of Walvis Bay in Namibia, famous for its coastal fog that forms as a cold Atlantic ocean current that meets the warm desert sand dunes. It's also famous for its ancient geology that preserves evidence of glaciations during a period of Earth's history known as Snowball Earth, when much of Earth's surface is thought to have been covered by ice. We have some similar geological evidence in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, but that is a different talk for a whole other time. 
So before I wrap up, I'd like to leave you with just a few more wildlife highlights from the Namibian desert. Flamingos are my new spirit animal and I have my lucky flamingo socks on today. So what's next? So all of the real science is yet to come and we've got many months and probably years of sample and data analysis, interpretation and publication ahead of us, as well as integrating our research with the two previous Easy One and Easy Two voyages. The multi-beam bathymetry data are already being processed and they'll be included in the next version of the International Bathymetric Chart of the Southern Ocean. And for the Australian Antarctic Science Community, um, the work at the Shackleton Ice Shelf continues in the upcoming 2024-25 season with a combined marine and terrestrial campaign to the Denman Glacier and Bunger Hills. So that about wraps up our journey. The photo at the bottom is me with the very enthusiastic meteorologist on what I think was one of the last days at the ice margin before we began our transit up to Namibia. So there are many people that I'd like to thank for their support, um, particularly Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future, which is one of our program partners and a partner in, in these science projects. The Alfred Wagner Institute and Johan Klages, Sebastian Krastel, who's the Voyage Chief Scientist, all of the scientists, technicians and crew of Palastern, especially the Aussie contingent and my watch partners and cabin mate, and everyone at Geoscience Australia that supported and enabled our voyage participation. And I'd especially like to shout out to some of the behind the scenes people like the field safety team and the login officers that I checked in with each day, um, our field operations team, travel, HR, um, our directors and our branch head, Jody, and our chief of division for all of the last minute approvals and my colleague in the Marine and Coastal Geoscience team, Rachel, for post-voyage support. So that's all that I have. I will leave it there. And um, I believe that we can open up for questions. <laughs>